that we're starting. Yes, if you would. Uh, Wait. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind doing that. <coughs> Eugene just takes over. Sherman goes to Dorothea Dix and has a little spat with a <laughs> a um, patron who is who placed there. <laughs> I figured out who that guy was. Who was it? Some kind of from like because he said he's done now since he's six or something like that. Yeah. Go back at the census records of all the inmates. So Ryan said that um, you're looking into the the main the third man that are on Duke's campus that are buried there as opposed to like where they get into a like So there's gotta be another skirmish that happens there. So there's one that takes place on the morning of the twenty fifth right down here. So so, uh, so it's actually like, hey, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you do have an audience on the phone, so. On the. On the ledger. Oh. Yeah. No pressure. So, do we need to go make an announcement that this is dirty? I think Jim has been making an announcement. Oh. He's been talking. Actually, he, when I came in, he was telling me. Gotcha. story and it's got some really twists and turns and what we see is that Raleigh, even though peace is being discussed here at Bennett Place, almost inherently to be destroyed twice. Two different occasions we see the Union Army almost
thing, especially once China can provide a broader concept of no seeing a book done for him. Oh, 
from the sounds of the new continuum, but this is a fairly ugly personal warfare of the most of those Confederates that are pulled from all four corners, desperately trying to stop the marauding army of Sturgeon as it moves off the, off the, uh, the civilian front there. Ultimately, Johnson, Joseph Johnson is put back in control. The South looks around for anybody, anybody they can stop Sherman. So they pull Johnson out of retirement. He's going to give him the daunting task of putting together an army, and they clash up here at the Battle of Bentonville. Largely unsuccessful, but uh, Sherman goes on to Goldsboro, resupplies, rearms, refits, and receives reinforcements. Johnston goes on to Smithfield and tries to lead the fight. Now, here is the man in question, who basically is out here at Um as a missing breakdown early in the war, after that first battle of Bull Run, he's sent west, and he is under this great um, disillusionment that his nightmares become that the South is going to rise up, and hundreds of thousands of men will be needed to stop the rebellion. And so he just starts such a nervous breakdown, and is pulled off of command, takes several months to recover, puts back in command, and never looks back. Now, why I use this picture is that if you see this little thing that's coming off of his sleeve, that's an important part of our story. And so that little thing that comes off the sleeve tells me very distinctly when this portrait is made. I will reveal that in a minute. Now, when I talk about how dark warfare had got of uh, moving to the Carolinas, the Union soldiers really were so excited, so enthused, and angry, this big place to secede, where Fort Sumter was fired on. Truly, Union soldiers felt that this was the den of snakes of secession that needed to be rousted out. So you do see a lot of towns burned, um, plantations burned. And the burning of Columbia truly becomes a um, nightmare fuel for those people in Raleigh. Columbia is the capital of South Carolina. And there's still a lot of controversy about what went on that led to the destruction of Columbia. Some people say, oh, Sherman burned it intentionally. Some people said that retreating Confederates started the fire that spread. But in doing the research, it just seems that these men were so anxious to bring revenge, to make South Carolinians pay for the war. Now, what didn't help was the trauma that they had on their battlefields from across the Civil War. And what else didn't help is that when they entered the city, they were greeted by jugs and jugs of liquor brought out by former enslaved folks and just loaded those guys up. So what I think happened is that Sherman's men let loose those bonds of military discipline and just lost it. And this scared Sherman. It really did. Seeing the destruction of what his men were capable of. Sherman and his generals were like, wow, that's a, that's a lot. We need to keep a closer eye on our men. Again, it will become a very poignant chapter in our upcoming story. There's nobody I enjoy talking about more than Judson Kilpatrick. He is a, Sherman called him one damn hell of a fool, but just the man he wanted to lead his cavalry division as he marches through the South. Now, why I love talking about Kilpatrick because he's so colorful, and I always love to say that he conquered the South with a harem in tow. You know what a harem is, right? He had a hard time keeping his pants on as he was campaigning in the South. Also, every night on TV, we see a relative of Justin Kilpatrick. Now, I'm about to show you a picture of who that is, and I know you guys will look at these two and say they are totally related. Yeah. Anderson Cooper is a relative of Justin Kilpatrick. Large nose, big ears, pointy head, they are spitting image of each other. But Kilpatrick is going to be the commander who is responsible for a lot of the skirmishing we're going to see that takes place in Wake County in these last days of the American Civil War. And you could also say it was almost responsible for the skirmish <coughs> that took place outside the Bayonne House. Now, we mentioned Joseph Johnston, the Confederate commander, and Joseph Johnston is a 
he's a he's a such a classic Victorian uh, commander, and he cared so much about his honor and what people thought about him more than most anything else. And the story that I love to tell about Johnston that comes to be a Mary Chestnut. He said that Johnston, whenever he would go hunting, he would never shoot anything, so he could always say that he never missed. It's a funny story. So Johnston is very, you know, his honor above everything. And when he's called out of retirement to, to pull this army together, he takes it as a great slap to his honor. He says, I've been called just to sort of be the scapegoat to surrender the army. So he is not happy about his new assignment, but he knows on behalf of the Baylor Confederacy, this is what duty demands. Now, again, opposing Kilpatrick are the Confederate cavalry. Now, these guys had been in the saddle for almost 10 months straight, opposing Sherman coming down from Chattanooga to Atlanta, and perhaps one of the only few Confederate bodies of men who are opposing Sherman as he is marching through the Carolinas. And this group right here, the 8th Texas Cavalry, are, are particularly interesting. And if you really want to know why the Wild West was wild after the Civil War, look no farther than these guys. Because by the time they reach here in the Research Triangle, they are completely and utterly demoralized. Uh, they have truly been ground down by war. And because the Confederacy's inability to stop Sherman, these guys get really frustrated and they start taking it out on the Union soldiers they capture. And again, that dark, ugly warfare chapter, these Confederates begin to uh, execute Union prisoners they capture. They dismember them, they cut their throats, they hang placards on their corpses saying death to foragers. So these guys are really almost as dangerous to the, to the friends as they are to the enemy because they're truly demoralized. And one of the guys I like to talk about is this fellow right here, John W. Rabb, who was in the Texas. And in 1863, Rabb was wounded, and his fellow soldiers said that his wound had robbed him of his reason. He survives the war, he's fighting around here at the end of his last days, and he was known for having a pistol that had 60 notches in the handle, one for every man he now, it's interesting to show just how, how this war haunts so many of the soldiers we're going to learn about. John W. Rabb, on the, the 20th anniversary of this final campaign, campaign that brings the armies here, April 10th, 1865, he starts. On April 10th, 1885, he takes that pistol, he had those 60 notches, and he kills himself in Texas. It's a story that's repeated on so many soldiers who are surrendered here and try to walk back home and to try to put their lives together after living through this experience. Now, I just told you that campaign that brought the armies here started April 10th, a day after Appomattox Courthouse. So a lot of people, you know, history books, the war ends at Appomattox, we can move on. But for us, this site being here today, we know that this war did not end. So there's a lot of these stories, and a lot of people are still dying at this time. Now, the relationship between what goes on at Bennett Place and Appomattox is, is simply based on the question, where did all of Lee's paroled army go? Lee had about 26,000 soldiers, and when they walk away from Appomattox, where do they go? And what we see is a lot of them start drifting into North Carolina. These soldiers who had their own trauma, starving, hungry, desperate, so what we see, especially for civilians, is a perfect storm. Sherman's army's moving west, Johnson's retreating army's moving west, Confederates drifting down from Virginia. So those, those civilians here in central North Carolina are truly caught in a perfect storm. They're getting it from all sides. And it's a very dangerous, desperate time. So the parolees from Appomattox complicate this story dramatically. Now, while the two armies are resting in Smithfield and Goldsboro, something amazing happens. Sherman's men learn that those Petersburg trenches that they were supposed to go pry the out of, Grant breaks them. April 2nd, suddenly 
charge of Grant's army breaks the lines, which forces the, the, the evacuation of Petersburg and the Confederate capital in Richmond. So the raised Appomattox courthouse. But that news reaches Raleigh. Great eruption. Great, great rejoicing. But what this does is it changes the entire game plan. So no longer is Sherman setting his sights on helping Grant in Petersburg. He sets the sights of this great army, numbering about 89,000 soldiers, more than any Confederate, any, all the Confederates in the field. Sherman's army dwarfs all of them. He sets his sights on this great army, not north, but swings slowly west. And the thing that Sherman needs to do now is no longer capture Lee, Petersburg, Richmond. It is destruction of Johnston's army. That is the only thing that's standing between peace and victory. So Johnston, put yourself in the com Confederate commander's shoes. The plan was to hook up with Lee, and together they would either fight Sherman or, or Grant. But all of a sudden, Lee disappears. Johnston's out of communication, so as he's trying to figure out what's going on, he has to keep his army ahead of Sherman, moving west. So what he does is he's going to try to, once he moves along the railroad, and at the town of Morrisville, he's going to split his soldiers to make a move faster to escape Sherman, join Lee, if he's still there, and somehow constitute this new army. So two corps of Johnston's army falls the railroad. One cuts cross country, goes through Chapel Hill, and goes west. Now Sherman, the last thing he wants to do is to chase this Confederate army all the way across the state, possibly back into the Deep South. It's going to be a hard slog, so he comes up with a plan. So what's he going to do? He's going to send his cavalry on the direct line following Johnston. Make sure Johnston feels like Sherman's going to follow on his path, but what's he going to do really? He's going to drop all of his infantry down, basically hit I-64, and race west and hopefully catch Johnston around Charlotte, right? Don't let him escape back into Georgia. And that's the plan. So this is a map from 1870 of Raleigh, and it's beautiful. It shows where all the people lived, all the accesses to Raleigh. And as these armies are rolling toward Wake County, um, another insane development hits. On April 12th, Sherman's men learned that Lee has surrendered. On April 11th, Johnston learns Lee has surrendered. So they're just wandering blind at this point. But Sherman believes that Johnston's going to make a stand at the Goose River. Great natural border. Johnston's going to fight there. So what does he do? He sends his cavalry on a search, like riding around on the south side of the Noose River, going to come up behind what he thinks Johnston's going to make a stand hit him from the rear. Well, the morning of April 12th, the plan is in action. And Raleigh is pandemonium. The city's being evacuated. The gold from the banks is being loaded on boxcars, moved west. The wounded from Pegwood Hospital put on boxcars, moved west. The archives, all the archives that we used to tell this story, taken out, put on boxcars, moved west. Everything of value to the Confederacy stripped from Raleigh, carried out to all these little podunk railroad towns, and the boxcars left with the engines going back to go and get more, to pull everything, to salvage everything that the Confederacy possibly could need to somehow fuel Johnston's army. But there's a lot of fighting outside because the, the Confederate cavalry is the rear guard. They're trying to slow Sherman down. His men are coming on hot and fast, so the Confederacy is fighting keep them at bay. The Confederate cavalry uh, infantry has already moved through Raleigh and started to move. Now, here in Hillsborough and in Chapel Hill, these two men live. Graham lives in Hillsborough. Swain is the president of the university in Chapel Hill. Now, these two men saw what was coming. They knew what the Union Army had done across Georgia. The specter of Columbia loomed large in their imagination. And why, why it meant so much to these two men is because they spent their entire careers as governors of North Carolina 
trying to, to, to modernize North Carolina. For so long, North Carolina had been called the old Rip Van Winkle State, based on that Washington urban story about the farmer who fell asleep and woke up 20 years later and witnessed all that had passed him by. That's pretty much how the nation considered North Carolina. So Swain and Graham, both progressive governors, they funded the railroad, extended uh, the dredge, the, the ports outside Wilmington, increased public education, and invested in the university in Chapel Hill. So when these two guys got together and said, we've got to do something to save the capital and save the university. So on the 12th, they ride to Raleigh, and they get out and they meet Johnston, I mean, uh, Zebulon Vance, the governor. And they say, let us go on a clandestine mission. We'll talk to Sherman, we'll get peace, we'll get quarter for the city and the university. And Sam Vance says, okay, don't tell anybody, and send them out. They jump on a rail car and they ride right into the skirmishing armies in western, eastern Wake County. But word gets out what these two were up to. Confederate orders come down to stop these men and arrest them. They shall not surrender North Carolina as long as the Confederacy is still a viable nation. So they do. They get to the Confederate pickets. They're heading towards Sherman's army. They're like, oh, that was close. And they see a rider run up, Confederate soldier, wave down, stop the train, and says, you are ordered back to Raleigh. So they're like, oh, we got close. So the train starts backing up. And about that time is when Sherman's great strategic flanking maneuver hits, plows through this thinly divided uh, uh, crossings of Swift Creek, right, and they capture Swain and Graham. They, you know, they start riddle the train with bullets, they capture the train, they take the two governors, and they actually do end up seeing Sherman. They plead their case to Sherman. Sherman thinks for a second and says, Okay, I will spare the university and spare the city. And as they're beginning to go back to share this good news, the city will be saved. Sherman says, hey, it's too dangerous to go back. Go back tomorrow, April 13th. So the two governors agree, and they just have a pleasant time talking with Sherman staff officers. Swain knew many of their families who had attended the university in years past. But word doesn't get back to Raleigh that this deal is struck. Zebulon Vance is like, oh man, they, they must have been killed or captured. I can't wait for them. So he leaves the evening of the 12th, giving the keys to the Capitol to the African-American janitor who's there. And he, he leaves. At some point, uh, the Capitol is ransacked. We don't know if it's retreating Confederates who were left in town, or was the Union Army that would occupy the city in the days to come. But this is the state library and the state geologic office for the samples from across the state. So just trash, books everywhere, cases broken. And this is a bus that was in the Capitol at the time, the bus that perhaps the one guy who was most responsible for bringing on the Civil War, South Carolina fire eater John C. Calhoun. And so this bus is in the art museum in Raleigh. And if you get really close to this bus, I mean, like really get up on it, you're going to see a, uh, a discoloration and uh, in the, this beautiful alabaster white marble. And somebody had taken an a inkwell, that jet black ink, and poured it over his head and wrote across the bottom, ah, the father of secession. So this is what the Capitol looked like pretty much at the time of the surrender. So we pick up our story on that morning of April 13th. It's raining, it's drizzly, Raleigh is being rocked by explosions. The Confederates have set fire to the munitions they can't take with them. So it's just echoing through the city. The streets are deserted. Swain and Graham prepare to come back into the city. They're boarding their train. And up to the train rides Kilpatrick. And he says, so I am told that Sherman has given the city safe court. And they say, yes, yes, yes. Patrick says, well, so be it, but if I meet any resistance, there will be hell to pay. So the two governors say, all right, no problem. They race back into town. <coughs> the train station's on fire, so they stop short. The two governors jump off. Swain and Graham says, all right, 
Graham says, I want to go race to Chapel Hill and let them know about the surrender. Swain says, great. I want to go to the Capitol and hand over the keys. And that's what he does. Finds the janitor, gets the keys, and he stands on the southern portal of the Capitol. And this is looking down Raleigh's Main Street, Fayetteville Street. And into his vision rides a big problem. As he's sitting there waiting for the Union Army to ride up, he sees a gaggle of Confederate cavalrymen ride into his view. And he called these men sort of the debris of our army. You know, it's like demoralized Confederates, lawless, you know, they're, they're supposed to be out of town. Why are they still here? But what they do next shocks Swain. Within sight of the Capitol, they tie up their horses and they begin looting a store right at the head of Fayetteville Street. Swain says to himself, this is not good. So he marches over and says, hey, you guys have got to get out of here. The Union Army's right up the street. So they kind of blow them off and go about their business. A shouting match erupts between them, other citizens, and finally one of the troopers turns to him and says, damn Sherman and damn the town too. We care for neither. At that moment, they begin to hear the strings of Hail Columbia, and they look down Fayetteville Street, and they can see Kilpatrick and his parade coming up. He's in his best uniform, flags unfurled, gloating at captured one of the last Confederate capitals. Now there's two versions of the story I'm about to tell you next. One comes from Cornelia Philip Spencer, and one comes from this lady, Millie Henry. Now Cornelia Philip Spencer wrote perhaps the earliest history of the end of the Civil War here in North Carolina, especially the Triangle. Her book is called The Last 90 Days of the War, and it was written in 1866. And she writes about the incident I'm about to explain probably got it from Swain, who was there. So she says that once the Union soldiers were riding up the street, all these Confederates dashed out of town, went down Hillsborough Street, joined the rest of the Confederate Army that's camped where NC State is today. But inexplicably, one soldier stays on his horse and waits. And as the parade gets closer and closer, he suddenly whips out his revolver and says, hurrah for the Southern Confederacy, and begins entering the, the, the chambers, trying to shoot at the Union parade. Puts his pistol back in his holster, whips his horse around, and jets down Morgan Street out of town. Now, the only thing is that Morgan Street didn't go out of town. It was a dead end. The only way over the railroad tracks was Hillsborough Street. So as he's trying to cut that corner to get up on Hillsborough Street to make his escape, his horse slips on this red rainy cobblestones. And before he could remount, he's captured. And he's brought back to Kilpatrick, who is in, enraged that this rebel would try to shoot at him after this peace negotiation had already been submitted. She says that uh, uh, Kilpatrick asked this trooper, why did you violate the truce? The young trooper says, well, I didn't know of any truce. Kilpatrick says, well, too bad turns to his staff officers and says, take this man out where none of the ladies can see him and hang him. He asks for five minutes to write his wife, cruelly denied. So the young trooper is hung where the governor's mansion is today, right in that sort of Lovejoy's Grove. Now, there was another eyewitness that tells us a vastly different story. Now, Millie Henry was an enslaved woman who had been born in Yazoo City, Mississippi. But when the war got too close to Yazoo City, uh, the Boylans pulled, was on the Boylan plantation there, and pulled all of his people back to Raleigh. So she was there that morning drawing water from a well on the Capitol ground. She saw the trooper fire, she saw him escape, she saw his capture, and she remembers reporting what this conversation, but she reports a very different conversation. Now in 1937, when the Works Progress Administration were interviewing former slaves, they found her, and what she saw was kind of burned into her memory. Because she said, and it's the only account I've ever found, um, Kilpatrick says, Sir, what is your name? He says, I am Robert Walsh of the 11th Texas Cavalry. Kilpatrick says, Why did you violate the truce? And in her version, the trooper says, Because I hate the Yankees and wish they were dead in a pile. It's worth been to say that Kilpatrick had been fighting his men dead in a pile, largely due to Texas cavalry. Kilpatrick says, well, to 
take this man out where no other ladies can see him and hang him. And in her version, he begins to laugh. He begins to laugh. He starts laughing and says, kind of you, sir, kind of you, all the way till they string him up. So it's a very weird story. I'm not sure how they parcel that out. Kilpatrick, well, this is his grave, Lieutenant Walsh. It's in Oakwood Cemetery today. Now, the real kicker about this story is that uh, for the past week, I've been trying to figure out the mysteries of this because when we look through the roster of the 11th Texas Cavalry, there is no Robert Walsh. So who was he? We just don't know. Kilpatrick knows he has to keep up this fate. Make Johnston believe that he's following him right on his trail. Sherman has led him off the chain. Do what you need to do, chase Johnston and chase him hard. So that's what he does. They spend about 30 minutes in the Capitol, um, and they get ready to take out after the Confederates. Now the Confederates, again, camped around Pogue and Gardner Streets in Raleigh. They believe Kilpatrick is going to just rest on his laurels and gloat, and that the braggart Kilpatrick is, he's going to just have a fun time relishing the fact and capturing the Confederate capital. So they're not really worried about him. So they take off their saddles and begin cooking breakfast. But in minutes, they begin to feel the ground rumble underneath their feet. And they look around, and before they know it, the Union cavalry has hit them. It hit them hard. One Confederate soldier said it was the worst stampede he'd ever seen, with men fleeing on foot, on horseback, bareback everywhere, just to get out of the way of this attack that killed Patrick's cavalry. These Confederates rally, they pull together, and they sort of lead a counter charge and stunt this approach. But this sets up the day's fighting, which is going to lead in a long, bloody battlefield that goes from Raleigh all the way to the town of Morrisville. Because all afternoon, Kilpatrick would push Confederates would countercharge and retreat. Kilpatrick would put up fresh units, keep charging forward all day long. Now, this is in the town of Morrisville. It's one of the most beautiful houses still left there, and it's a period home. And if you would have been here in June of 1861, you would have seen tables full of food, women in their fine clothes, young new recruits from the Confederacy headed off to the very short and glorious war. The Morrisville Grays were organized in a lawn. The Page House. And Malchus Page, you see here, is one of the regiment's first lieutenants. Now, I'm sure that these guys, when they marched off, got on the trains and headed to war in Virginia, that they would never, in their wildest dreams, believe that the war would really, truly roll to their very doorsteps. But this is what happened. And as the army starts pouring into Mooresville, um, a lot of things are taking place. The Page family hides in the basement of this house. And if you go to the, uh, the, this house, which is still privately owned, the chimney that's on the far left shows a lot of the, the damage from the skirmishing for about the this evening. Now, this kind of is, if, if we had to talk about the epicenter of the fighting in Morrisville, you were standing at ground zero. Uh, off to your right are some of the train station buildings that were left. Um, uh, you see this historic home in the back. Uh, the Page House is probably about 200 yards behind this. But um, this is where the train station was in Morrisville, built uh, in 1850 for the North Carolina Railroad. And if you look back in the far picture, Morrisville sort of in a valley. And these are the heights above the town. Now, as Confederate cavalry ride into here, they see a dangerous situation unveil, unfolding. So I told you that Hitchhiker sort of moved all of these train goods to kind of keep them out of the hands of the Army. Well, in Morrisville, trying to get up the, 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 the slope going out of town toward Durham is a train. Attached to this train are boxcars full of necessities the Confederacy needs food, weapons, telegraph wire. But also connected are boxcars of the wounded, all these wounded men. And it's not making very fast progress because it's so heavy and the slope is so steep. So the Confederacy says, ah, we've got to do something. So they make a snap decision. They dismount and they begin banning barricades around the station to protect the station to buy time for this train to escape. 
when the Union Army arrives on this heights above Morrisville, they peer down into the valley. They're like, oh good, we have a chance to put another feather in our hat for the capture of this train. Kilpatrick deploys his artillery on these heights and begins shelling Morrisville, throwing shells in. He pulls up his regiments for a charge in order to capture this important Confederate train. So to overlay the situation as I understand it on this modern map, you see the artillery placed on the uh, heights. You see the Thomas Jordan's 1st Brigade kind of forming on the low, flat ground of the Walnut Creek. Wheeler has his men around the train station. And these two other blocks to kind of cover the retreating Confederates because, again, Johnson splits his army. Confederate army is going to follow each one. Now the boots and saddle charge is sounded. It's the first time the Confederates all day put up such a stiff resistance that breaks the Union Army charge. Within 150 yards of the train station, the withering fire of the Confederates stop the attack, and they buy time. But that train is not moving anywhere fast. So the Confederates have to make another snap decision. They decide to uncouple those cars with the supplies and let the wounded escape. <coughs> they go on to Durham. The Confederates uncover Morrisville, and that stops the fighting that night. Now, this is one of the cannonballs that was found in Morrisville in the 90s. Uh, this is fired from the, well, it wasn't fired, but this was from the 24th New York Light Artillery. Now, these guys had spent the war guarding Washington. But with Sherman's march to the Carolinas, they were sent, sent here, made into horse artillery, and were campaigning with Sherman. Now, the story behind these is that these kids playing on the soccer field in Morrisville were playing in the creek and found these cannonballs that came running up to mom and dad and said, look what we found. And they were still armed. And I think what happened is that, you know, typical soldiers that, you see this little brass part at top, you have to screw the fuse in to arm the shell. So these soldiers, after the battle, these things are already armed, and nobody wants to take the risk on unarming these things. So they just kind of looked around and threw them in the water. So, yeah, they are still on display at the town hall in Morrisville. Now, I tell this story because it's a funny little story that this guy is General Reynolds, and he was a general that was wounded at the fighting in Bentonville. But he was on that train in Morrisville, the one that escaped. And how he was wounded, he was sitting on his horse at the Battle of Bentonville, and screaming out of the sky comes a cannonball, hits the horse Reynolds is sitting on, passes through the horse, exits the other side, and takes his leg off as it exits. So you imagine a fountain of blood just in taken to Raleigh, his leg is suited up, put on these train cars, moved west, and his aides were in the engine helping to motivate the conductor. And how they were doing that, they had his pistols on him. He said, if this train falls into the enemy, it's the last thing to do. So he's going to start shoveling a lot faster. But they escape. Now, that night, as the guns fall silent, an amazing sight appears in Morrisville. Federal pickets, through the darkness that night, see two riders. One is a Confederate officer. The second one is a private carrying a white flag. And they have a letter from Joseph Johnston. When they read it, they can't believe their eyes. It is a request for an armistice. Let us meet and end this war. So as they're trying to figure out how to, how to make this armistice uh, a real thing about meeting and talking about peace, there's still more fighting. Moving into Durham is pretty quiet, but the Confederates put up a lot stiffer resistance fighting through Chapel Hill. So there are skirmishes all along the road, basically between Morrisville and Chapel Hill. Uh, one of the ones I, I like to talk about, if you guys know where South Point Mall is, one of the last skirmishes over New Hope Creek took place there on April 15th, just days before the generals meet here. And in charge of that, um, that brigade is Smith D. Atkins, who we saw fighting in Morrisville. And this is a little out of our scope, but it's such a funny story I had to tell it. That Smith D. Atkins uh. occupies Chapel Hill. The, the Union Army has Durham. The 
Union Army has Chapel Hill, the Confederates have Hills Grove. So Smith the Atkins knows that they're going to be in Chapel Hill for a while because word comes to them is that as Sherman and Johnson are trying to work out this armistice, the army's freezing for them. So his troops are excited to be in a college town, right? There's girls in the college town. Ella Swain is the daughter of Governor Swain. And Swain is there at his house to meet Atkins and sort of work out the deal for this, this uneasy peace between Union soldiers who are occupying the city. And Ella Swain, like many young girls, is such a devout, die-hard Confederate. She hates the Yankees. Oh, does she hate the Yankees. And the fact that one of them is in her library is just beyond reproach. So her father's making small talk with Swain. Swain says, you know, you're not the first uh, army to occupy this area. Cornwallis did during uh, the Revolution. I've got a book on it if you want to see it. And I'm sure Atkins was like trying to make nice. He's like, sure, whatever. So Swain calls to his daughter and said, Ellie, would you fetch that book for me from the library? And she's like, are you serious? Are you like, stomps into the library, snatches the book off the bookshelf, stomps into the room, hands the book to her father, looks at Atkins, and falls in love. <laughs> A wonderful love affair ensues between these two, highly hated by everybody in town. And they would actually become, they would actually be married. Uh, by the end of 1865. And just to show you how unpopular it was, when wedding invitations went out, people in Chapel Hill would just spit on them. But it's a, it's a great story. But back to Wake County. Behind the cavalry becomes Sherman's army. 85,000 soldiers. That's a lot of people. Especially put in an already overcrowded town. A town filled with refugees, uh, bringing their enslaved people. It's just chaos. And this is a house that no longer stands. It's a plantation house called Will's Forest, uh, pretty much on Glenwood Avenue in Raleigh. And it was home of the Devereux family. Now, when Sherman's army arrived, the entire upstairs is filled with panic-stricken refugees. So they were uh, the Bergwood family, cousins of Devereux. And Margaret Devereux remembered that when the, the armies approached, the alarm was sounded. So she jumps up has to go upstairs to warn everybody upstairs. And as she's running through the house, she looks through the room, and she sees her yard filling up with Union soldiers. She dashes up the stairs. She grabs Mrs. Berkeley, and they walk over to the window, and they look down, and all they see are these dirty faces of these men looking up at them. And there's even a guy crawling up the outside of the house. So to show you the mental state of refugees, to show what, what the the rumors and the gossip in the newspaper and the letters of what you could expect in the path of Sherman's army. Mrs. Bergwood turns to Margaret and says, you know, rather than face the ravaging of what we're about to happen to us, she said, we can always throw ourselves from the window to prefer suicide for what their imaginations thought was about to happen. Ultimately, they're saved through the entire life. Now, to kind of give you a little idea of what this looks like, this is a map that was drawn by the soldier 20th Corps, one of the six in Sherman's army, as they're approached to Raleigh. And we see that little red outline. That's our earthwork. And these little rectangle bars have got the slash through them. Those are the, the core, the big divisions in the army. So you can see how spread out at least just one core is um, around Raleigh. Now, remember Sherman's master plan to kill. Johnson. He's going to send his infantry down and race Johnson on a parallel course. And that's what he does. Jones Crossroads is the town of Apex. And again, we see the core drift down from that flanking movement. So it's amazing you can kind of see, again, who lives on this route as Union officers are drawing the path of these armies. And this is what a campsite in Raleigh would have looked like in the 17th Corps. And these men had been marching for over 500 miles. Not really a firm set of camps. So by the time they get to Raleigh, they know they're going to be there for a while for this negotiations to take place. So they, they put together a stellar camp. And they were so proud when this newspaper reporter drew their camp for the Harper's Weekly. So they're very proud. And they're put to work doing a lot of random stuff just to keep them busy. 
And one of the things they do to keep busy is this. Um, if you guys know where Central Prison is, right across from Diggs Park on Western Boulevard, right as you turn into uh, Central Prison, if you could look down to your right, there is this huge boulder. And a fellow named Wilson Dixon of the Company C of the 1st Missouri Engineers had a good old time tagging this rock. He carved his name in here as they were waiting. And he was known as the Artisifer. It's a hard thing to say, okay? A soldier who would repair things, repair wagons, cannons, anything they need to repair. He was a craftsman. So yeah, he had the tools to do this. And it's fascinating that when you look him up on the 1860 census, He's illiterate, so at some point during the army, he has learned to read. And I think some of his letters are backwards, and you can see it on a clearer version. But there's a lot of graffiti still left from the Union occupation in Raleigh. This is one of my favorites. This is upstairs in the attic of the state capitol. It says, April 13, 1865, the Union U.S. Army Signal Station. And... The guy who was responsible for the signal station is this, Lieutenant George Round. And Round arrives in the Capitol late on that night of the 13th, and he's kind of staggering around the top of the Capitol trying to figure out where to put these signal rockets and signal flags so it would be sort of like the central switchboard to communicate with all these armies. And as he's walking around, he climbs up on the dome of the Capitol, and he suddenly hears this cracking the glass skylight he just stepped on in the top of the Capitol. If you've been to the Capitol, it's about a 50-foot drop to the floor of the Capitol. It's just a skylight. So the only thing that saves George Round is the thin chicken wire that catches him before he can fall through. Now, he spends the entire war on top of the what the final weeks of the war on top of the Capitol has a great view. We fast forward to when the war ends, and he's trying to announce this surrender to the rest of the army. He's sending up these signal rockets on top of the Capitol. He lights one, sends it off, lights another one, and he lights one, and it kind of fizzles. It's like, oh, all right, I've got to change it out. As he goes to change it, of course, you know what happens. It goes off. Shoots up in his face, he burns his face, he stumbles back, falls through the skylight a second time. And he's saved again, but he gets up, finishes his message with this peace on earth and goodwill to all. That's how Raleigh celebrated. That's how George Round announced the news to all the armies, the surrender that took place here. Now, the city of Raleigh bought Dorothea Dix, the asylum. The last patient that was seen there is in 2012. And so they're trying to turn it into Dix Park. And we talk about the Union Army camped out there, about 15,000 soldiers. And this was one of them, George Wetstein. Uh, Wetstein was a very reluctant soldier. He was drafted in the summer of 1864, left three young daughters at home, sent off to this far, wonderful, weird place called North Carolina, and arrives April 9, 1865, just a day before the army moves out. While these armies are in place, Wetstein's personality begins to change. On the evening of the 23rd, he, he complains to his messmates that he's got a headache. Goes to sleep that night. When the roll call is sounded on April 24th, he's nowhere to be seen. They run over to his tent, and they find out that at some point during the night, he'd taken off his suspenders and taken one end and ran it through the hole of the other end and hung himself. Killed himself. We don't know why. But he's still buried at the National Cemetery of Raleigh today, so he never left Raleigh. Dispatches go back and forth between Hillsborough and Raleigh. Johnston and Sherman are going to agree to meet on April 17th, somewhere between the two armies. That morning, Johnston gets on his horse, gets his escort, the cavalryman, starts riding down the Hillsborough Road heading east. Sherman is still in Raleigh. He's going to get on the train. He's going to take it to Durham, meet Kilpatrick, and ride west. It's a little meet. So Sherman begins to board the train. He, um, he's handed a, a telegraph operator, runs down, and says, General Sherman, I'm receiving a secret cipher dispatch from Moorhead City. I think you should, should wait till I translate it. 
be cozy. Truman says fine. Waits about 15 minutes. The telegraph operator returns, and his face is white as a sheet. Hands the note to Sherman. Sherman reads it, and his face wilts. Folds it up, puts it in his pocket, swears the telegraph operator to secrecy. Do not reveal a single word of this message. Gets on the train, goes to Carrie, calls his commanders on board, says, Hey, be here when I get back, I got some news for you. Goes to Morrisville, calls his commanders on, does the same thing. Gets to Durham, meets Kilpatrick, and they ride till they meet just a little farther down the road. And they agree to use this small, tiny farmhouse they just passed on the side of the road. The two generals walk into the house. Johnston sits down. Sherman closes the door. As he turns around, he produces this telegraph he received in Raleigh. Hands it to Johnston. And if you believe Sherman's memoirs, Johnston, great beads of sweat are pouring out Johnston's head. And he exclaims, great God, what a calamity for the South. And that note? Revealed the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Johnson knows this is the worst thing for the South. Asking for a quarter of Lincoln's death, this is the worst thing that could have happened. Sherman knows he needs to get back and control his men. Sherman says, Hey, I need this surrender. Johnson says, Hey, I don't really have to surrender. I'm two days marching on you. I can keep this thing going. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll talk to President Jefferson Davis. We will surrender. Under the entire Confederacy, reunite the nation, end the war in this very house. Sherman says, Ooh, that 24 hours is going to be rough, but he gambles and said, All right, let's do it. <coughs> the prize is much bigger, but I have to get back to Raleigh. So they agreed to meet on the April 18th. Shake hands, Johnson goes west, Sherman rides east. Retraces the steps, shows the telegraph commanders all the way to Raleigh. When he reaches Raleigh, he doubles his guard and really prepares for for a long night. Now, some of the most heartfelt letters and diaries I've ever read in the Civil War come from the reactions from Union soldiers. And they're really touching. And I'm reading some of these letters. These guys are, their hearts are truly torn asunder by Lincoln's death. Just these incredible stories. And, and that grief that just laid them so low begins to curdle. They begin to get really Soldiers in twos and threes, threes and fours, fives and tens, tens and twenties, get together and say, you know, we need to go burn out that rebel hole. So that's what they do. That night, a mob of about 2,000 soldiers began to march off of, from the, around the asylum to burn Raleigh. The second time Raleigh is facing destruction. <coughs> this guy right here, you know, John Logan, gets word of it. And you notice he is wearing another thing on his sleeve. Logan hears about this mob that's going to destroy the city. He's like, I've got to do something. Rides out, confronts these men. And Logan knew what these men were capable of because it was his men that had put the torch to Columbia. So he knew the power of destruction, the potential these men could unleash on Raleigh. He begs his men. He tells them, men, do not disperse the great record of this army as peace is at hand. Go back to camp. And they don't. They blow right past it. A second time, Logan tries to stop this mob, and again, they, they walk right past him. It's only when he rides forward and calls to his own artillery, probably stationed on those earthworks we saw, and he orders his own Union artillery to load the most lethal munition in the Union Army's war chest, canister. So you imagine taking a two-liter bottle and just filling with lead balls. And once you put that into a cannon, it turns into one giant shotgun. Imagine doubling that. So he orders his men to double canister, points it at this mob, and approaches them for the last time. He said, uh, well, gentlemen, you can either go back to camp or I'll join you back to camp. And the men say, that's a great idea. We'll go back to camp. <laughs> So Logan is credited with saving the city of Raleigh. And he's put into the Raleigh Hall of Fame, which I think is hilarious. But the other thing you should know about John Logan is every time he is, he's perhaps one of the, the, the biggest benefactors and supporter of Memorial Day. So next time you guys are grilling burgers and drinking beer, think of Black Jack Logan. And 
that picture of Sherman you saw, and these little armbands, these are mourning bands, death of Lincoln. So we know that these two pictures are taken very soon after Lincoln's death, so they must have looked a lot like this while they were here at Bennett Place at Family Hall. Sherman and Johnston do meet a final time. They come up with crazy terms of, the Confederates always bring their own terms. They're approved, Sherman signs it off, the war is ended, uh, one set of terms that goes to Jefferson Davis for approval. The rest go to Washington for their approval. The army's just hanging around for two weeks. But once Sherman's terms get to Raleigh, people's heads explode, especially after Lincoln's death. The South, on paper, do not pay the penalty for starting the war. And in fact, they get their constitutional rights back, including what constitutional right? The constitutional right to own people. So when this gets a while, Washington, Sherman is called a traitor. Grant, Ulysses L. Grant, his old friend, is sent to Raleigh to replace him. So you can imagine that day when uh, Sherman is happy about ending the war, and he sees U.S. Grant walk into the governor's mansion in Raleigh, where his headquarters are, and he's like, oh, Grant, you're here. I'm so excited to see you. And then he thinks for a second and says, why are you here? And he tells about the rejection. He tells Sherman, just go meet Johnston one more time, Give him the same terms I gave, read it out to Maddox. And that's what I mean here on the 26th. But this is a pretty rare drawing of Ulysses S. Grant and Sherman reviewing the troops. This is Fayetteville Street, right down the main street in Raleigh. So who was president after Lincoln's assassination? Andrew Johnson, who was born on Fayetteville Street in Raleigh. And this is his home place, which is now at the Mordecai Historic Park. Johnson's uh, father is buried in the city cemetery in Raleigh and becomes a tourist attraction. All the soldiers are excited to go see the new president's father's grave. But a lot of soldiers really don't think that Andy Johnson's up to snuff to leave the country. And it turns out he's not. Soft on Southerners, the first presidents to be almost impeached, and the Republicans take over for radical reconstruction after. And this is it. This is how they get to Bennett Place. And I encourage you to see the film that tells the story. Talk to your tour guides, take a tour of the house, and that's how the boy did Wake County. Thank you guys.